1930s. Time to begin, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to uh, the mid-morning, early lunchtime afternoon session. We've got an hour and a half, three talks. First of all, we'll be having Wiki Loves Parliaments, followed by How Commons Made Equality Photographer Out of Me with Diego Delso, who'll be telling us all about you know, quality images, featured photographs, and how you can become a better photographer. And finally, for the last half hour, something called DMCA Takedowns, Inappropriate Images, and more, How the LCA Team Uses Technology to Scale. That will be with James Alexander. The hashtag apparently is Wikimania2014 if you want to tweet about this. We've got our tech person at the back of the if you've got any technical problems. Uh, please do feel free to come and go as you wish, but if you have questions I'd recommend coming down a bit closer so we can hear you because there's no, there's no working microphones. Anyway, our first talk is Wiki Loves Parliament. So that's coming to you from Olaf Kaczynski, Manuel Schneider, and he's yes, he's not oh here. yeah, but it'll all be all right on the night. But we have this gentleman to stand in at a moment's notice of all is not quite right, so don't worry about it. Um, they'll be talking to us about their project, which involves shooting politicians. <laughs> yeah, something we've all dreamt of, alas, in this case, just with cameras. But you know, Wikimedia things start in a small way who knows where it might lead anyway so without further ado i shall pass you over to olaf kaczynski So I could, uh, first can ask uh, you, who ever participated in the Wikileaks par Parliament project? Please raise your hand. Oh, thank you, thank you for doing so. Um, and as you see, so the talks uh, will be presented by two people. Olaf, who is uh, responsible for the Wikileaks Parliament project since two years, and it's mostly on the organizational base and Manuel Schneider who is number 8686 who um, is doing um, so we are Wikileaks Parliament as a photo project so we're taking pictures of parliament members but I think they will tell you anyway and um, Manuel is um, doing was taking videos uh, of the parliament members and ask them to uh, give some statements uh, about it. I'm Martin. I'm also one of the organizers of Wikileaks Parliaments. Well, this time, well, the next time is, will be in the uh, Parliament of Germany, the, the Bundestag, and in one month. So uh, we were uh, moving through uh, Germany and uh, to the, the federal state par parliaments and um, I'm now going to the German Parliament itself. We also had a quick uh, move to Strasbourg where we took pictures of the European um, members of the, no, the members of the European Parliament and <coughs> I hope so that gives you an impression what you uh, what the talk will be about. So, yeah, so, uh, so um, just a quick note to everyone. Uh, if you want to make um, SVG diagrams to show what a uh, particular parliament's makeup is, um, I've created a tool which I've put on the lab's server, um, which I need testers for. So I did this during the hackathon. If you give the name of each party and the number of delegates of each party and pick a color from the, from the color pickers, 
then fancy. Okay. Oops, up, up here. <laughs> <laughs> then um, you can create a diagram and then create an SVG diagram for you, which if you open it, you can save this and upload it to Wikimedia oh, Commons. So nice. I'm looking for this <laughs> So that was our presentation. Thank you for coming. <laughs> <laughs> so please stop. <laughs> Now I start with my presentation. Uh, I hope Manuel will come every time. Uh, because uh, his English is better than mine. I, I can help him. Yes, he can help me. Um, it was, uh, we show uh, later a photo uh, where I, I speak in German for the German uh, members of the group uh, and Manuel in English for the other members. <laughs> And it was better. Yeah, Vigilas Parliaments um, in February in the European Parliament. Uh, the idea was uh, not that, not this, this is not the idea. <laughs> this is not the idea that Wikipedia is in the Parliament. Um, the bad picture. Um, um, this is the German Bundestag. <laughs> I hope we're in three weeks in the German Bundestag, uh, but not uh, sitting uh, to photograph. Um, the idea was to take pictures of all MEPs, uh, um, to write new articles in other language, and uh, to talk about the creation and collection of free knowledge because many of the MEPs or staff of MEPs, they have no idea what is uh, free knowledge, what is a free license, and what is Wikipedia. But it's driven by volunteers. Yes, and, and working by volunteers. And, yeah! There he is. <laughs> Sorry, I had to set up the streaming for a session which is running right now. So, <laughs> but I told Olaf. Okay. Uh, sorry. No. <laughs> okay. So uh, if you want, if you are interested in the MediaWiki consortium, you can join the Google Hangout there. <laughs> <laughs> but better you'd listen to us. Okay. I guess it's really then interesting. Then yeah. musst du mal weiter. <laughs> okay. Die Aktivitäten sind alles andere. Okay. So you've already uh, introduced into yes. the, yes. the <laughs> project. project. So, yes. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> So uh, when we went to the state parliaments, we had like these photographers taking the high quality pictures. We had Wikipedia editors with us who would sit down together with politicians if they had a need to discuss their articles. Uh, apart from that, we started just recently, like December last year, we started with uh, also taking videos yes. to have some short one, like one minute state uh, statements of the politicians that was especially interesting when we went to the European Parliament because I mean the German politicians would have would give us their statements in German that's nice for German Wikipedia because apart from just the picture you will also hear their voice you would hear which party they are working for and what their main focus of work is um, we tell them, because this is a bit tricky um, with like neutral point of view, etc. So we do tell them, please keep it short, keep it generic, because maybe in a year or in your next leg legislation period, you might be doing something different. So try to give us a statement that is uh, not too much tied to what they do right now and what might change in the future. And uh, most of them actually most do it quite well. And uh, so it's good and actually something to improve the article. Uh, we have to do a lot of organization and there's a lot of logistics involved in it. You bring a lot of people into a parliament. You have 52. to- 52. In, yeah, we'll come to that later yeah, in yes, when okay. we talk about Europe. Okay. But in general, in general, you bring a lot of people into a state parliament or in a parliament. You need to give them the list of names beforehand. Sometimes they even want like the passport numbers or something because there's security attached. It was very interesting that at least with this, with the parliaments, the bureaucracy 
I'm not talking about European Parliament here, but with the other parliaments, bureaucracy has been actually quite low. So once they know who we are, they are like, yeah, just take the back entrance, it's okay, or something like this. And um, so, they, so they mostly have been really helpful, but even apart from that, you need to do a lot of logistics. You need to get all the equipment there, back, uh, need to rent stuff, like cameras or so lights or whatever you want. Yeah, we usually have two, two, two four photo booths where we take the pictures. And uh, of course, we need the equipment, which is uh, uh, provided by Wikimedia Germany or Wikimedia Austria. And yeah, and also oh, it was mainly Olaf's uh, task to do a lot of research in advance, like who are all these people putting together a list on Wikipedia, looking who of them have uh, good photos already or who need improvement, etc. Who might not even have an article, etc., etc. We'll come to that later in more detail. Then we had cosmetics. So we had like from one school where people learn the cosmetic thing, a uh, cosmetic yes, school. Yes, cosmetic school. Um, they, they would uh, come with us. Basically, we just have to provide for the costs. For them, it's a big fun to do. It's also a practice of their work. But only for the travel cost. Yes. Yeah, yeah it's, it's only, only the, for tra the travel cost. Yeah. And, um, and we would have professional cosmetics because they may, would make sure that the politicians don't look like me right now in front <laughs> of the lamp, sweating, etc. So they look nice and we get really professional pictures. Spits on their shirts and such. Yeah, and uh, I mean, if we look at the number of pictures taken and the quality and the cost, it's actually, I think, quite fair. And there is also a training attached to it because we have like the old timers that come uh, to the project, the already right professional people. We have new people coming in, especially at the European Parliament, where we had a lot of people who've never done such kind of a project before. So. It all started in 2009 in Lower Saxony, it's a state of Germany. There are uh, 136 members of parliament out of 152, that's like 90%, have been... No picture. Did, no. They did not have a picture, yes. but they had pictures afterwards. No. Yes, after. after yes. Exactly. <laughs> so, so there is kind of an improvement. Until today, um, 14 of 16 German state parliaments have had such a project, so have been improved. Of course, you are inviting politicians, so there's not a guarantee that all of them are actually showing up. This is why they are only like 90% covered, not 100%. But actually the ratio is getting better and better because also the different state parliaments, uh, the, the officials of the state parliaments, they talk to each other, they have their own conferences and they talk about how great these projects work. And in the end, I think like it started like 2013, 14, when people actually approached us like, when are you yes. coming? Yes. <laughs> yes. While in the, the very first uh, project were quite hard because you had to convince them and tell them what crazy thing you are planning to do. Ben and there are high security buildings, right? And you bring in these bunch of anonymous people, etc. German newspapers make fun of the um, still missing uh, parliaments who have, uh, who, uh, which don't have pictures yet. So uh, that's re the, uh, the result of our activities. <laughs> Yeah, one, one of the politicians actually once said to Olaf, you make all the difference to Wikipedia. So basically, you show up, now finally we know who Wikipedia is. So This is very, very important. Yeah. Okay, so all the people, all the volunteers, this is very important. Which, yeah, which is also <laughs> like, we were talking about organization, which is a, a big part of organizing this project. Uh, it also means like yeah, getting all the volunteers on board you need, and it sometimes has to make has to do with selecting, and uh, it also has to do with yeah, setting up like uh, a policy, like you can dress however you want, but just make sure that it fits into the environment kind of, be nice even to politicians of a party you don't like treat everyone equally, nice, and, you know, 
I mean, we want to come back and we want to give a positive image impression. of Wikipedia, a positive impression. So, this is how it looked before. I mean, these were a few of the pictures that actually existed, um, along with many pictures that did, simply did not exist at all. And you see the quality is not exactly what you might want to have in an encyclopedia. Um, you see, no picture in here. This is a very nice article, right? It really invites you to read it, maybe not. Um, this is some statistics. Um, this is from the European Parliament's list before of... Before the project. That's before the project. You see, um, there's a lot of... Olaf will show you this later. We use some semantic media wiki to bring in all the list of uh, members of parliaments to uh, define their countries and stuff. We could take a lot from actually from the European Parliament's website. They have an XML download there where you can download their database. Unfortunately, it has only very few properties per MEP available. And uh, yeah, that's in European Parliament, we talk about 766 members of parliaments and about 382 images, rough 50% that actually needed improvement and 316 images that needed, that weren't there at all. So that makes like 91%. Um, this is how it looked. We did it in February this year. We had in the end 52 Wikimedians from 10 countries and we had, apart from these 10 from the native languages, from the countries they come from, we had also Catalan, Alemannic, Italian. Italian? Uh, we did not have Italian. Native speaker. Na we did have Italian native speakers, but we did not have a Wikimedian from Italy. Yes. This is why it's in the yes. additional list. Additional. Uh, Polish, we did not have Polish uh, Wikipedians, but Polish speakers, Czech, Kurdish, Russian. So basically 62 languages available. Yeah. But yeah, a lot of countries. So I, I would even say this is maybe was one of the biggest editathons happening, kind of like international and everything. And so this is uh, one image of the group. We were in a hotel in Germany nearby the border to Strasbourg because that is much cheaper than being in Strasbourg directly and rent, simply renting a bus that in the morning gets you there. It took us 20 minutes or so. Uh, so I think even if we were somewhere in the suburbs of Strasbourg and would have taken like the public transport, it would have taken us the same amount of time. And that was actually much cheaper, way more convenient because we could transport all our equipment. And this is in the morning, at, at Monday morning, when all the people came in and we sat together and we first discussed what are we going to do. And also explain for those who have not been yet at such a project, how is it going to work? Um, yeah, that's me explaining. That is how it later looked like. You see there have been like, I think, three photo booths. We also had, um, uh, pardon? Yeah, we, we also had uh, uh, another area behind that wall uh, where people were sitting down. Well, there was the cosmetic area, which was quite big. We had an area to sit down to write the articles. We had uh, the video booth as well. Uh, let's look at the figures. So those are the re results. Um, well, I have to shortly see where are so you see like yeah the percentage column is maybe the imp interesting one how many people actually showed up like 55 percent of the german meps showed up at our booth got a picture taken for instance the greek people only 18 people came yeah you see this in also in the action column it shows you nine of 10, 22 people from Belgium, for instance, showing up at our booth. Um, 
this is the comments page where we have, but we are now switching to the browser and show you some more actual, actual stuff. Basically, after after doing the European Parliament, this uh, name Wiki loves Parliaments emerged somehow. Before that, it was like more like a German thing, and this is why we decided to have this, uh, this presentation here today. You see here um, Austrian, Austrian, Germany. German, and <laughs> British Australian. <laughs> <laughs> Discussing the, discussing the lens that I think this is the Austrian lens with the yes. German camera. Yes. yes. <laughs> so yeah, I, I hear people recognizing the equipment here. Yeah. We young girl. Yeah, people taking pictures. Um, young people with old politicians. <laughs> she's, yeah, she's actually uh, the 50. daughter the daughter of one of uh, our of a very good photographer in the German community. So we are also making sure that there is the next generation. <laughs> um, yeah, people working, typing, editing Wikipedia articles. And very important, very always important. have something to invite people. So we had a small counter there in front of our area, put some sweets there. And um, politicians I mean, are always hungry. Some sweets. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, maybe Dutch someone Paul. recognizes this guy. He's also at Wikimania. Uh, Belgium, I think, or Dutch, yeah, no, no, or both. Yeah. And Belgium, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you see, we had these claps here with the names pre-printed, so that uh, yeah, first you take a photo with this, and then the actual photo. So later you can uh, you know which person is who when you have like this whole bunch of pictures later on your hard drive. Um, that's, is, is that a, can I play it right away? This is Roberto Metzola, a video in Maltese. Uh, we got a lot of strange languages. Uh, I mean, I love these languages. Uh, I'm not it's also a very crazy language. So where, where is your output for audio? <laughs> you, 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 you know your computer well, don't you? Vorne, vorne. In the front. Here it is. Okay, let's try this. Ah. <laughs> people, uh, 200 videos <laughs> taken in, uh, I don't have it available right now, a uh, bunch of languages. Uh, hmm? Yeah, we got these two roll-ups there as well, because it's not only that we want to get more content and better content, we also uh, want to talk to politicians and tell them about Wikipedia and how it works. I mean, most of them have no idea. And like the, the, the quote we had before, uh, many people later say, oh, that's really good that I met you. It's really interesting. And we had actually in the European Parliament, uh, it was the, the budgeting was through a, a grant from Wikimedia Foundation. And there was a very heavy discussion ab around this, whether it's worth the money and it's not too way too expensive, etc., to get these pictures. And well, you could just contact the European Parliament; they should give you the images under free license. Well, been there, done that for many years. 
with not only the European Parliament, also many others. Yeah, okay. So we just yeah. okay. So we just thought like yeah, and and by the way, this is more than just t getting a bunch of freely licensed pictures, as you see. Um, yeah. Yeah, we also meet some other people from media. Though this guy, he's. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this guy made the uh, birthday song for Chancellor Merkel for two weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and 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 he, he he's he's basically reporting for German uh, uh, German public broadcaster from Brussels and Strasbourg. So and this years. time we turned around. We we just change the roles. And he gave us a video statement for Wikipedia and a nice picture of, as well. As you see, we already saw these. Group photo. Where, yeah. is the, where is the cup? Here. We produced the cup, which as a present to all those who went there and spent one week. During the project. So at the first During day the we project, took, took the picture. The photo is taken at Monday and uh, the cup Sent away right and away to the company. Yes. The cup has been then produced and delivered to the hotel so we could give them out on Thursday. Oh, yes. <laughs> and also we gave a few of those to some key people in the European yes. Parliament, obviously. So the press speaker of the European Parliament has now this cup on her desk. Yes. And she's actually the wife of this ZDF guy. Yes. Yes. But that's just coincidence. Yeah, you see another picture how uh, pictures are being taken. This is... Yeah, you <laughs> see, this is the reception corner with the suites, and in these uh, self-made binders, we have all these papers with the names uh, sorted alphabetically and put into these binders by country. So when somebody, because if you have like 766 MEPs, this is like such a pile of paper. So you need to find it quickly. They come here, say, yeah, I'm this person from Austria. And then you go like, OK, here's Austria. And this is your paper. Please sign it so you agree with the that it's being published on Wikipedia, etc. And the same, this is what we put on the clap for the first image, right? And then later, we just collect it and keep it. Yeah. Testing, setup. You see the chair. The chair is also something we learned that it's interesting. It's just good to have a chair because people can sit on it, lean on it, or something. It gives you a more um, active, active look. Yes, active. The cosmetics ongoing. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Photo booths again, photo booths in action. You see how the, the chair is being used here. Um, media. media. I mean, they did not know that we were there, but they saw us, obviously, and then they were like, yeah, what are you doing here? So we had like every day somebody was coming by French asking for them. interviews and stuff. Um, cosmetics again. This is me doing the interview with some, ah, that's a French Front National guy, <laughs> actually. As I said, you have to treat them all equally. <laughs> Everyone gets his chance. And by the way, in the European Parliament, I didn't mention that, is we ask them to give statements in as many languages as possible. So normally their native language plus English. But some of them, like I had like a Swedish guy who spoke fluently French, so he gave me like free statements. Or I had like English speakers who also speak Welsh, Kymrek, and uh, or Gaelic. So we, we've got all those recorded on our comments now. Yeah, photo booths, <laughs> checking <laughs> pictures checking so pictures. the politicians could see the result right away, could check, uh, is it good or <laughs> if we need to do a new. If you, if you look on comments, you will find more of these lists and evaluations. We did some suite of tools where we could gather uh, and prepare nice wiki tables with uh, wiki data statements existing for these people or uh, articles existing in so, which yeah. languages, etc. So this but is the main page of the uh, German project. Of the German project, and I've created a list 
well, with reusage, with usage on Wikipedia and reusage, and you can find it here for the uh, quite long list, um, mostly uh, web pages, but also in, in newspapers around the world. Um, our images are used, for example, by the German Parliament itself, when um, uh, well, the German Council, more precisely, and it's uh, also used on the French Parliament site, for example, and on and a couple of other pages. Um, and yeah, I hope to spread. Uh, we hope to spread the, the word about free, uh, free knowledges and free licenses, and um, are happy when we see a, a correctly licensed image of uh, and the reusage. Um, okay. <laughs> and you will I think you will hear uh, of the upcoming uh, Bundestag project in the media somehow, <laughs> hopefully. Uh, probably five, five seconds, five seconds only to show it. Uh, we have to, to organize this uh, um, semantic media wiki. Semanti media wiki na, uh, um, yeah, from, from, from basically it does most of the work automatically because you can simply import all the MEPs and then you can link them to the parties and then you can this automatically is, create lists. Side, and this is a site from, from each MEP with an old picture or no picture, the new picture uh, and from which country, the national political group uh, or the political group in the uh, European Parliament, uh, the data to Wikidata, the link, uh, the link to comments. Uh, and um, also yeah. to show uh, here the, the um, if there is their action shows uh, there was by the, by the project or no. If they are attended, yeah. Yes. yeah. So you can now click on these different links and then it will give you all the MEPs from Malta or all those in this political group, etc. It's boring, but... Um, With a simple uh, line of code, you can yes. get the results you uh, probably saw and so the percentages and the, the uh, pa pa uh, uh, pie chart. This is uh, the, the site from the members who had a new photo now, and the code is. Okay, but you can, you can find this is all up on the wiki. You can yes, find all yes. Well. take what it to the. Calls, email, OLAP, and manual. Okay, oh. <laughs> that's, that's the code from this site. Oh. Yes. It's a nice, yes. nice, nice, tiny, simple bit of could be better. Not being a coder myself, that was pretty impressive. Thank you very much. Hold up, my name. But, but we have to thank uh, all the 50 people who oh. was there in Strasbourg for one week. Sure. And all, all the other ones as well. Uh, yes. More than 200. Yes. Right. Well, thank you. The whole thing filling up. Thank you all for coming along and, uh, and listening to Olaf Manuel about what he loves Parliament. We've got two more sessions to come. And of course, if you're interested, so you live in your own Parliament, please, please contact them. The, uh, you can use the logo. <laughs> right. In half an hour time, we've got DME. DMCA takedowns. I better have another look at that. It's quite a, a mouthful. The the, 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 next, the final session. DMCA takedowns. Inappropriate images and more. How the LCA team uses technology to scale. In other words, there's all these requests to take things down. How do we use technology to automate and systematize the process and make it better? But before then, we have comments made a quality photographer out of me with Diego Delso. Hello. Hello, everyone. Um, okay, I realize today I have a lot of stuff, so I'm going to be very quick. I'm going to show you more slides, actually, than minutes I have. So I just begin. Um, uh, some people are curious about me. I put some stuff together. I will upload the presentation in, uh, in uh, of course, in the uh, official uh, category in common, so you will uh, have a chance to read all this. Maybe 
just a few words and I'm Spaniard as you can hear <laughs> um, but still kind of world uh, citizen I've been traveling very often and lived in different countries um, I studied electrical engineering based now in Munich Germany and love traveling um, photography and free knowledge and I think this is a good mix for for commons um, I started in uh, Wikipedia, I did in Wikipedia 2007, at the end of 2007, and I'm quite crazy and quite a uh, uh, strange guy because after 10 days I started doing uh, kind of maintenance. I had no clue about it, but I uh, did it. So the uh, administrators there had a, lot, a tough time with me. Um, a few months later I, I uploaded my first image to Commons. Um, and um, 2009 I became administrator and bureaucrat in the Spanish Wikipedia. Uh, got a lot of, uh, I wrote a lot of articles, right now I think at about 1,100, a um, lot of edits. And uh, someday I discovered a page in Commons called Quality Images. And since then you will see, I mean until, until here, everything is mostly Wikipedia project and after that is everything Commons. So actually I can say today that my home wiki is commons and um, it's due to QI. I will, um, okay, uh, I will tell you a lot of things about QI. Um, three months after my first QI, I got my first uh, featured picture, which I never thought I would manage. Um, uh, one year, 1,000 quality images, which is a lot. Um, uh, I uploaded in December 10,000 pictures. Um, I have already 100 pictures um, featured in Commons, and I guess maybe end of this month I will reach 5,000 quality images. So, uh, what I... What you say, uh, now we're going to the topic. Uh, what do you, I hope you take uh, from this presentation is that you know a little bit more about Commons, uh, the history, some numbers, um, what kind of awards we have right now in, in, in Commons. We will, deep, uh, we will dig a bit into the, into the process of quality images. Uh, what is the idea of quality images? Why, why did it come? Um, what are the criteria of the quality images? Actually, I will show you a lot of examples of my first contributions to uh, to Commons, which was before I discovered quality images and, and uh, the current contribution, so you will see, I think, a kind of difference. And I hope that you enjoy the pictures and have a good time. So, um, now some cold uh, rough numbers. Uh, we have, uh, the numbers are not so up to date, uh, I got them end of July. So we got uh, about 22 million of files in Commons, 97% of them are images. So we have a few documents, we have a few audio files, and very few videos. So almost 97% yeah, of, all of all files are actual images. Um, and now I am really wondering who of you know about these three things, so feature, picture, quality image, valued image? Okay, half. okay, so. <laughs> Um, so these are the three kind of awards we have today in, in Commons, or the featured pictures, they are those that we say they are the finest, they are the best pictures, they are pictures where we expect both our quality and also this wow effect. So we don't have many of these, sorry, uh, yeah. uh, we don't have so many of these, we have today or two weeks ago 6,000 pictures and it makes uh, in comparison to the, to the total number of pictures, one out of 3,000 pictures in Commons is featured. Quality images, we have 10 times more, uh, one out of 300, and valued images, we have uh, one out of 2,500. So quality picture means that the, the picture, it doesn't matter what the subject is, is, is uh, has a good quality. Uh, featured picture means it is a quality picture and it has uh, it's an eye-catching picture, so, um, um, kind of wow effect and then we have also the valued picture uh, valued images which is kind of new well new came uh, two years after quality images and th this is uh, an award to recognize uh, the value uh, the value of some pictures because they are some kind of unique or because they illustrate one topic especially good so um, now uh, okay a very short uh, overview of milestones in commons so before there was Commons, uh, we had Wikipedias, and they, there were three Wikipedias, English, German, and Chinese. They had already a featured picture process in place. 
So after Wikimedia Commons was launched on uh, September 7, 2004, um, then uh, two months later we had also this approach in, in Wikimedia Commons. So the first Wikimedia um, uh, Commons feature picture came out in on February 5th and it was this peacock head. Um, the first QI came uh, two years later, it was this uh, landscape in Turkey, I will tell you now more about QI. And the first value um, image came again two years later and was this uh, the Manhattan Bridge under construction in 1999. 19, 19, okay. Um, <coughs> okay. Uh, I, I did some investigation. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> Gideon. Um, why this all came came together? What happened? What was the what was the origin of these quality images? So. And I uh, came to the conclusion three things came together. Um, so the kind of spark, which was the need of a wiki uh, a com a commoner who looked for um, good pictures, uh, 12 good pictures of one single theme. And uh, uh, it looks like it was a hard, he had a hard time to find them. So uh, it was tricky to find among millions of pictures, uh, good pictures about one single topic. So then it, it was Gideon who came to the idea to kind of export the process from the good, art, good article in, in the English Wikipedia into the into Commons and kind of uh, uh, award a good um, good contribution. And then of course we had Daniel, thank you. <coughs> we had a, a lot of uh, a, a kind of platform uh, for the automation for the processing of all these uh, nominations. Uh, without this. Uh, nothing would run today. Uh, we have so many nominations today, the amount of work needed uh, that, that should be done per, per hand would be crazy. So, um, I have here a quotation from, from Gideon. Um, so the idea was um, to have uh, to, to identify that good work, which was not feature pictures. Um, uh, <coughs> the thing was, everybody was focusing on very nice pictures with this wow effect, but there were also a lot of other pictures that we needed in common for for all kinds of articles, like uh, like a glass of water or like a brick, uh, nobody would come to the idea. Okay, this is going to be a feature picture, but uh, we still needed them. So, so there was a kind of um, um, rewarding to those people, uh, putting effort in, in in that area. And I think that the current mechanism and philosophy of, of of quality images didn't change since then. Okay, a lot of text. I know. Um, <laughs> I can tell you. Uh, it was a crazy time when I uh, I had visited some some courses, some photography courses, but by far I didn't learn as much as I learned in Commons. Um, the beginning was tough eh, because now I mean it's not like in the course where you have the teacher in front of you and, and, and if he sees that you are in trouble, he will help you. Uh, now here you get uh, tough statements, and uh, if you nominate something which is uh, crap, then uh, <laughs> they will tell you this crap. Um, so. <laughs> Um, at the beginning, I, um, I nominated pictures that uh, I believe they were good, mostly because they were beautiful. And that's the wrong criteria for quality images. And, um, and I nominated pictures without really knowing why they couldn't be a quality image. So um, there was the funniest phase at the beginning when uh, <laughs> some people came and declined my picture saying, uh, you have chromatic aberration or or, uh, or this or that, and it, I didn't even know what they were talking about. <laughs> so it was really a learning curve, first trying to understand the language, so what they were talking about then, and it was, this was also a, a, a tricky uh, step to see what they were seeing, <laughs> because uh, after I knew what, what I had to look for, I didn't find it in the picture. So we review all these pictures in full size, but still I couldn't see what they were talking about. So. Uh, so it develops with the time that you see what. So now I see mostly everything, but uh, at the beginning it was not so obvious. So and of course then you have to figure out how you fix these problems or what kind of software do you need for this? How to use this software? So that was the problems. That were the problems at the beginning, and now, now it's a different animal. Now, um, so when I take a picture, I uh, actually I think sometimes about quality images. So I know how to take the picture. For example, in some room in the top. So that when I make a perspective correction, uh, it will still look okay. So these kind of things, um, I now before I nominate pictures, I know exactly where are the typical problems, and I, I look there for um, maybe correction. I can fix those problems easily, um, and um, and I think uh, now it's the other way around. Now I try to help others who are mostly new, 
and so I know what they have to go through, and I think it's it's uh, it's good. <laughs> so I took a lot of, of a lot of knowledge, a lot of experience from Commons, and I have now the possibility to give it back. So and still after years, uh, it is great. Um, I learn every day something new, and I, I get inspired uh, every day also about the great works of other photographers. Um, if uh, and I, <laughs> this is a hint here. I think it's it's, it's good. Uh, to go it this way, if you like these featured pictures, if you would like to contribute with those, it's better if you first um, begin with uh, with quality images, so you get a good solid basic uh, basis about the technical requirements, and then you can you can look for a good moment for a good subject and and make a featured picture out of this. Okay, uh, I, I promise. I think this is the last uh, slide with so much text. Um, <laughs> I have now later on some nice uh, some practical examples. So um, I want to uh, briefly explain how this works. So we have um, so when you decide to nominate pictures, there is actually a tool called um, QI Nominator, which um, is, is very uh, convenient. You just select the pictures you want to nominate. You go to this page. I will show it to you later if there is time, and you just um, so make a click, and the wiki text uh, drops the the whole nominations. You save, and that's it. So and then the, the pictures will show up in the top with the so the pictures here, and then there is a description field with the blue frame, and then they are ready for um, review. So uh, two things can happen. Uh, one guy believes this is a quality image and, and says, okay, I will promote it, so it becomes. So green, like here, or uh, somebody says, this, "There's no way that it, does this picture becomes a quality image." So he, she will decline, and it gets red. Or um, there is a potential to be a quality image. So um, you write a comment and suggest to the author what to do, what to change, what to correct in order to to uh, to make out of it a quality image. So in this case, it remains blue as is as it was, and, and you add comments. So this could be. Sometimes we have five loops until uh, the picture starts far that it becomes a quality image. So um, the process, uh, so there is a way to uh, balance the process to, to neutralize a promote or a decline from a first reviewer. So um, if a reviewer considers this picture is a quality picture, uh, a quality image, uh, but the second one thinks it does not the case, then we can always um, put this uh, the candidate in discussion. So, so you can let's say neutralize the first uh, vote, and, and and then the picture, the vote will move the picture to a new section where you can, um, when you, we are actually asking uh, additional reviewers to to give a to give an opinion about it. Okay, and I think it's a good practice to nominate as many pictures as you review, so that then the, we would like to distribute the, the load of work. So, um, no, where's not the last one? Okay, this is also <laughs> very quickly. Um, the requirements: What is a quality image? Um, there are two sets of requirements. Some, uh, one of them is non-technical requirements. Uh, sounds obvious. Having a good description and uh, having accurate categories is not so obvious because for those who are no uh, bio, uh, biologists, bio, 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 biology experts, um, <coughs> uh, well, you, you go to the forest to make a nice picture of a butterfly, Lepidoptera, whatever insects, and uh, find out what is it. So if you don't have these species, then it's not going to be a quality image. So sometimes I do sometimes expend, I spend more time uh, digging, uh, trying to figure out what I have photographed and uh, go in there and take the picture. So um, <laughs> this is not so obvious. And of course, one of the prerequisites of quality images is that the work is done by a common commoner. So uh, you cannot just take a picture from somewhere in the internet, from Flickr, with a free license and, and upload it in, uh, in commons and nominate it to, to quality images. Um, Okay, and then we have a bunch of technical requirements. I will. Uh, this is actually a subset of them. Uh, I will go very quick. Um, resolution should be at least two megapixels. I think this is the same requirement as in 2006. I don't know. Maybe somewhere we we need to increase it. 
um, noise should be low or um, and um, no no JPEG artifacts. Uh, so this is due to due to JPEG compression. Sometimes there are some pixels problems. The exposure should be good, um, which is not always easy. As you see, maybe in these two images, uh, this is far too. I mean, this is a backlighting picture, and, and there is no detail here. So maybe uh, artistically, it is a good picture, but um, if you cannot uh, appreciate the detail of the picture of the, of the subject, then it's not a quality image. Here, this is a very tricky one. Actually, <laughs> this is the worst thing you can do. It is underexposed here and overexposed here, so you have no good exposure anywhere. Um, my main problem, uh, actually, my pictures is dust. So I have uh, <laughs> my, my, my equipment is dirty. Always looks like uh, when I uh, upload the pictures, I find dust dust spots everywhere. Uh, lens flares, pignetin. You know, I don't know if you know the pignetin when it's uh, darker in the corners. Uh, that's called pignetin. Um, so these are kind of problems we should highlight in in quality images. Also watermarks. Composition is of course important. Sometimes we find pictures where we don't know what the subject is uh, or what the what they are about. So this is um, uh, yeah. important. Also, the crop is important. Sometimes uh, the subject is so the crop is so tight that the, the, the subject cannot breathe. Um, color problems like chromatic aberration that I will show you uh, briefly and um, yeah, the white balance. Sometimes pictures are <coughs> uh, greenish, bluish. Cold, warm. Um, this is also something that you don't see at the beginning, and you need some time, some time to realize this. So this, this uh, is easier after you have spent uh, some time there. So you get this uh, notion of of, uh, of the white balance. Um, of course, focus, um, sharpness, uh, depth of field. This is also required. And this is uh, one of the key <laughs> topics here in quality images. Some people are not really happy with this. Uh, that we expect, for example, that um, mostly verticals are vertical. So, uh, so you know this. Uh, here I have two examples of falling lines. Uh, this is not vertical, so it's it's falling in. Here is the other way around. The, the base is, is smaller than the the top of the back pen or uh, back bed. Um, yeah. This is a, a this is a uh, recursive topic in quality images, and um, okay, I think that's it. Um, um, I don't know. I mean, actually, so I explained you the process, so roughly what are requirements. So maybe you'd like to try it somewhere. Um, <laughs> nobody will bite you. Um, um, this are <laughs> look. Oh, okay. Perspective distortion. <laughs> <laughs> We're coming to. Uh, <laughs> okay, um, just to get a feeling. Uh, what kind of uh, issues um, uh, we usually deal with? Um, there are some problems that are fixable, like the description, dust, dust spots, noise, or chromatic aberration, if you see it. <laughs> Um, there are some problems that sometimes can be fixed, mostly uh, like distortions, uh, making this uh, falling in verticals vertical. The overexposed areas, of course, if you work with RAW, you can easily fix this. If you work directly with JPEG, it can get tricky. Um, and there are also some uh, issues where we mostly uh, directly decline because of um, there is no way to save it, uh, like a lack of sharpness or missing focus or motion blur or composition, uh, composition problems like a very cluttered image where you don't know what, what, what you are looking at. Um, okay, uh, I got some data from uh, Daniel about the amount of QIs from almost from the beginning, 2007 until today. So the blue line is the promoted one. So we have, we are growing. So every, everything is going up. Uh, this is the declines and this is the unassessed, unassessed pictures. So um, that you get a feeling, a um, bit more than two thirds of all pictures get promoted. 18% or 90% are rejected and about 12% uh, are, uh, are not assessed. So it means uh, nobody uh, reviewed them because uh, it is voluntary work and, or, or there was a tie in the, in the votes. Um, okay, and this is my promise, uh, my last uh, text. <laughs> <laughs> you can read this later, I think. Uh, <laughs> um, so wh why does, I was thinking about this, uh, what happened to me and why do I believe that all this works? Why, why, how is this learning process being fostered? 
Um, I think the very uh, one nice thing is that you drop something and then after a few hours you get feedback. So this is good. <laughs> so because sometimes uh, you wonder, okay, how good are actually my pictures? And it's good to have a third opinion of somebody else who doesn't know you, who who, who has uh, no prejudice against, against you and, and, and says, oh, actually this is a good picture or oh, please forget it. Um, so that's good. Um, we have a bunch of experienced users there uh, who many of them have learned a lot from common. So uh, I think, of course, this is important because uh, those that have not, not so much experience will, will, uh, will learn quickly. Um, the process is very simple. I think uh, I managed it to explain it in one slide. So the rules are fair, I think, are clear and easy to understand. And of course, then we have Daniel's uh, bots to, to keep all this running. And, um, and then on top of this, we have this awarding system which motivates some people to to uh, or kind of uh, is a, re a reward for for their for their work. So this is the QIs, but also uh, feature pictures, or valued images, or picture of the year. Okay, and then there are also of course some initiatives from from the chapters. For example, um, uh, the organization of um, photo events like wiki takes, aerial photography, wiki last monuments, but also um, uh, workshops like you know, Photoshop, Lightroom. Um, and also there are also some chapters where you can uh, participate or, or learn some of their um, uh, technological pool and borrow some, some cameras or lenses. So, and now I'm mostly done. So I have a couple of examples. I, I showed you this uh, earlier, uh, not good expo. I mean, this were, actually this is darker here than here even. So uh, not a good exposure. This is tricky, it's a contrast full image. Uh, this is terrible. <laughs> this is in Fort uh, Pavol in Nikko in Japan. Uh, much too much light. I don't. I don't <laughs> beginning. <laughs> uh, this you saw earlier, and uh, this is the Colorado River. Uh, nothing is properly exposed. So we have here underexposure and and uh, in the in the bottom, and here is everything is, is burned out. So that's gone. There is no detail there. You, you cannot appreciate any any errors. Any detail anymore, um, and this is also this is now a good example from last year, from last Wikimania, where you see um, it was also tricky because the the foreground was also very dark. There was it was a strong shadow, uh, and the, and the bottom was very bright. So I think I managed to have a good compromise. Here. Uh, this is from April. It's gonna be deleted soon. I hate uh, freedom, freedom of panorama. Um, <laughs> I took this. I took it from from the bottom. I, I dropped the camera in, the, in on, on the floor. It's a, a wide angle camera, and uh, so it's very stable. So I don't even need a tripod in the charts and uh, to get this kind of pictures. So it is an actually a high dynamic range picture with uh, three exposures. Uh, okay, perspective problems. As mentioned, uh, we have these leaning lines. Uh, what is vertical is not vertical here. Also, we have here some problems with the crop. This would be uh, cloned out. Um, the sample earlier, you have seen it, uh, the same. This is a good example also from last year um, with some nice verticals here <laughs> in Kowloon in Hong Kong. Um, this is in Munich. Uh, this is a, a dealership um, where you see all horizontals are nicely horizontal and all verticals vertical. When I took the picture, it was a mess. I had to. Uh, <laughs> work it i think i will work it like two hours to get it like this it was not so easy um there was no actually i was on the floor so um it looks like i was in front of uh, this car in the middle but uh, i was i was somewhere here so <laughs> tricky uh color problems so this thing this thing looks uh, greenies um this thing looks i don't know strange uh, it's not natural um and what i mentioned earlier um Okay, you can appreciate it there, maybe here. This uh, I, I magnify this area and you see some strange colors here, like purple and red, this is called chromatic aberration. This is what I mentioned at the beginning, I couldn't see it, but it's there and it doesn't belong there because it, it's not for real. It's a problem of the lens or, yeah. Um, okay, here the same in, in uh, Christchurch, so we, I um, amplify the area here and you can see some strange colors here and here, blue and purple. Okay, chromatic aberration. This is more or less a truthful, <laughs> you have to believe me, <laughs> truthful <laughs> color picture. <laughs> and um, this one is uh, a sunflowers uh, landscape in Spain. 
um, this is a different topic. Um, so uh, it looks nice, maybe, uh, but uh, all pictures that we review in, in quality images, we do it at full size. So sometimes you, you, you think like when you see the thumbnail, you say, hey, great, that's it's a nice picture. But if you look into it, uh, you, you see no detail. So that's a problem. Um, the same here in the United Nations um, Assembly Hall, we have here some noise you know, in this area. This is even worse. The, the lighting conditions were bad. So here you have a blue, no, not blue, but uh, green and, and uh, orange, I don't know, all kinds of colors. Um, this is uh, chromatic noise. It uh, can be removed. It's not good. Um, so this is now two examples of three of crispy pictures. So I took this, it looks like bananas, but believe me, this is very small and there is a lot of detail here. Uh, this one, for example, uh, okay, and I think the last topic now, I, I talk about composition issues. Here you can even see not only the composition is a mess because uh, it's cropped in the top, uh, it is actually bent. Yeah? This is a called barrel distortion. So the, this should be, I don't know if you can appreciate this. Uh, should be straight, I thought. Um, same mess, mess of a crop here. Uh, this is in Montreal. Um, this could have been, and I regret this one. It was could have been a great picture if I had shown the the, the mouth and the face of the snake char uh, uh, charmer, but I didn't. <laughs> here it's also too tight, so that was a pity. What? And no, no, actually no. I, I think they look uh, more dangerous than they are. Uh, I think they were um, kind of uh, dark. <laughs> um, okay, um, also a mess. Uh, tourists here, uh, I cut the mountains on the top, uh, colors terrible. Um, okay, and this is a nice balance uh, picture where, where you see some nice verticals and with with this actually it kind of balances the, the, the big um, skyscraper here. So this was also challenging because there were like 5,000 people there and I took a wide angle uh, <laughs> lens and it looked like oh, I was alone on the, in the beach. Uh, uh, this is in Porto. It's also a nice perspective of the Don Luis first uh, bridge. Uh, this was in April. I was hoping of having uh, nice uh, summer pictures there and it was the winter uh, uh, alarm and look <laughs> was also nice. Um, and this is the last problem I, I mentioned earlier. Uh, I took this picture in New Zealand. I have no clue what what species of lupinus this is. And now I could help me so far. There are about 300, I think, of them. Uh, watermarks, um, again, mm, I don't know what this is. Um, and then, so there are nice, um, uh, this is in, in Macau, in Tenerife. This is an auditorium. This is Petra, the monastery. This is a nice village in Spain. It's almost abandoned. And uh, just saying uh, happy birthday to Wikimedia Commons. <laughs> Not today, I think it's in, uh, on September 7th, but uh, I used the chance, the chance to do it. Um, so thank you. Well, thank you very much, Diego. And I, and I write and say that next month, September, is Wiki Loves Monuments again? Yeah. That's right. So. Please get out there, start taking your photos or start digging through your hard disk. I'm sure you've, you've all got hundreds and hundreds of photos. You are actually, you are actually in a listed building, so you can just... <laughs> <laughs> if you're looking to, to cheat a bit, you can just upload hundreds of pictures of the Barbican. Everything you take here is in a listed building. Right, well that was Diego Delso, How Commons Made a Quality Photographer Out of Me. And I hope it will inspire you to, to follow his example, just taking lots and making your pictures better and better. But now we're moving on to a, a somewhat different topic, though connected, as, as, as he, for example, taking down photos, as he was worried about his um, freedom of panorama issue with Macedonia. Um, I'm not intimately familiar with Macedonian law and photography, but this chap probably is. And I'll hand you over now to James Alexander, who will be talking to us about, well, there you go. <laughs> but no point me repeating what's on the side. James Alexander. So, 
So as we say, my name is James Alexander. Um, I've been a, an editor for a long time, for almost nine years now, um, and been working at the foundation for the past four, actually four as of Monday. Um, and so um, one of the big things that we do is we work on sort of the legal process. And I, I've gone through a couple different different things within the foundation, but underlying it, even when I was doing fundraising, was doing a little bit of this. Um, and so I'm now with the Legal and Community Advocacy Department, um, which is, as it sounds, two different groups. It's the legal group um, and the community advocacy group um, under the general counsel, um, Jeff Brigham, and of course, our, our trustee stuff, Tiger Rory. Um, the community advocacy department is just five of us. Um, and while the lawyers work on a lot of sort of the nitty gritty uh, legal policies and the, le and the legal work, um, we do a lot more of the interaction with the community, um, both um, for legal, um, but also with the rest of the foundation. Um, we go through and we talk about, we do a lot of change management. That's a lot of, especially legal policies, like the, the terms of use rollout, the new privacy policy um, conversations that went for almost three or four months. Um, volunteer support, especially with um, advanced users, so OTRS administrators, ombudsman, check user, um, the arbitration committees on the different projects, um, working with them, especially since they have a lot of sort of more legally and privacy sensitive um, work. Um, correspondence management, which is sort of a lot of the mail, especially physical mail or emails that come to the foundation themselves. Uh, a lot we'll have people who go through it briefly but then if it needs a response it comes to us and we can troubleshoot it either sending it on to OTRS finding a community member who can work with it or responding directly um, that also includes things like mail, um, being the product owner for the mailing lists and um, trying to engage with the community on that side um, actually um, uh, we also deal with the staff support and uh, um, with legal process when we get subpoenas, uh, search warrants, or DMCA take takedowns and copyright. Um, and then working with the internal tools and trying to make everything else go faster. Um, my focus, um, and what a lot of my team does, at, at least on the periphery, if, um, and sometimes having to focus on it, um, is sort of safeguarding the trust and safety um, of the projects um, and of the entire user base, making sure that everything stays legally compliant, that people understand what's happening, um, and that we respond really quickly. Um, and that sort of engages both into that staff and the volunteer support um, that we do, that I talked about earlier. Um, and unfortunately, it can end up talking about a lot of things. Um, that all come up really quickly. It's threats of harm, which is like suicide threats, bomb threats, assassination threats, uh, copyright violations like DMCA takedowns or, or just notices that, uh, that we might have copyright violations on the projects, inappropriate images, which are a really nice way to say child pornography, um, ch uh, child protection issues in general when we worry that somebody's um, under threat, um, legal process, which is subpoenas, search warrants, um, legal threats in general for lawsuits, um, as well as OTRS escalations, BLP subjects who are getting, who are getting angry and, and nobody else has been able to uh, calm them down, the mailing list themselves, staff rights, when a, when a staff member needs um, access to, uh, to certain uh, privileged rights, we want to make sure that we can track them. Um, and we all have to do all of that for a user base that's over half a billion people um, a month. And, and those are people coming in and out. And, and the reality is that we have to support all of them because the people who are e emailing OTRS, the people who are emailing us, the people who may be making threats or receiving threats um, are not necessarily the relatively smaller group of only 80 to 100,000 people who, et who edit regularly every day, uh, month. Um, so we actually have to engage with and be on the lookout for all of them. Um, because of that, a large part of it is to try to get those done faster and to get them done more efficient. Um, because we don't really have, um, we don't have the time. We have a lot of other things we want to do. A lot of that, that long list of things um, takes up most of our time. It comes up unexpectedly. It has to get done really quickly. Um, and so we want to get those done efficiently, successfully, and out the door because in the end, we want to do training for OTRS members. We want to make sure that the community members get the training they want, get the answers they need. We want to do long-term projects. 
Um, and if we and if we're stuck just responding to emergency things that pop up, we can't do that. Um, and so over the past couple of years, we've worked on different processes and different tools that allow you to do that. The first step is always to use the low-hanging fruit. It's how can we use what we already have, usually a third-party tool, um, in order to, to, to just make it work faster, make sure we record what we're doing, we know what we're doing. Um, and so, for example, just basic emails. This is our emergency at box, which is an email address that community members or sometimes non-editors non will send us an email address when they see a threat of harm on the projects. So when they see somebody make a suicide threat on their user page, or go, go to a school's art, uh, an article about a school and make a bomb threat that'll be there in a couple of days. Um, those are things that we need to uh, find out about really quickly, address, figure out whether they're credible, and then work with law enforcement. Um, and so we have it all sent into an email address, and this use very basic um, email filters, and we've had now for about three, three and a half years, um, that send it out to all of the, uh, all the staff members who work on it and who look at it, and that is especially the sort of top five community ad the advocacy folks. We also have a couple of the lawyers, a couple of the PR folks, um, a couple of psychologists within the foundation watching there just in case. Um, that originally was very rudimentary, and so it would send an email out, and then it would send an email out to our phones, and so we would get text messages um, automatically from all of that. We've now switched it to a system called PagerDuty, and so it actually sends an email um, to a, a third-party service that is designed for commercial sysadmins and operations folks, so that when the server goes down, they know and they can respond. Um, and PagerDuty knows when we're on call, so we always have at least one, usually two of us, um, around just in case, and it just starts braiding you. It'll send you an email. It'll send you a text. It'll start start calling you a couple times. If it can't get a hold of you, it'll go to the next. It'll go to the next person um, to make sure that these get addressed as soon as absolutely possible. Um, because we don't know if it's if it's credible, somebody may be going to try to kill themselves or somebody else right now, and we want to figure that out. Um, and in the end, we get these on average about once every three days. Um, and on a full moon, like this weekend, sometimes they can go a lot faster. Um, all of us were a little suspicious that that was actually a thing. Um, unfortunately, it really does seem to be. There's, there's more crazy people who come out when there's a full moon. Um, if you look here, this email address actually goes to a special email address, which was our be one of the beginning of attempting to start tracking our cases much closer. And so I'll get back to it a little bit later. Um, but actually, it that email actually automatically creates a case in our sugar, our case management system. Um, after email, obviously, we start going to something slightly more complicated. Um, in this case, Google Docs and online spreadsheets. Um, the online was really important because we needed to keep track of it so that it wasn't just one of us who had it on our, um, on our laptops, especially if we didn't have a laptop. Um, but we also wanted to make sure that we could keep track of everything we were doing. So for example, this is a spreadsheet where we ke uh, keep track of the use cases for staff rights. And so if we're going to give out a privileged access that normally community members have to go through a long uh, process of election, selection, um, we want to know that they actually need it for their work and why and for how long so that we can keep track of that and remove it when they don't need it, um, as well as remove it when they leave. Um, so that we remember they actually had it, um, especially if it's not a global right and it's on some smaller project um, where, where it needs to be taken away. Um, now, actually, a lot of these are, are uh, being moved by a bot under Meta so that you can see it on Wiki. Um, we also created a, uh, a simple uh, form that goes into a spreadsheet that just kept track of every time that we released private information, usually law enforcement um, because of an emergency threat, maybe we had a subpoena, um, or we just need, needed to get an email address to give to the, to the legal team so that they could warn them that we got, uh, that we got so they could warn a user that we got a threat. Um, but we also, we wanted to keep track of all of those. We wanted to make sure that anytime we were giving away private information, we one knew that we had done it, um, and we knew why, um, so that no one was trying to remember two years back exactly what happened if somebody asks a question. Um, we then started moving to, uh, to, to things that were a little bit more specific. Um, so, right? Um, that, that were sort of a little bit more custom made for what we were looking for. So this is Sugar CRM, which is an open source um, 
CRM, they have a commercial version that you can use in the cloud. We use the community version and it's actually installed locally. Um, originally it was installed in the San Francisco offices from a local server, um, is now installed on a private instance in WMF Labs. Um, but it's our entire case and contact management system. Um, and so we hold contacts of law enforcement that we've worked with so that we don't have to find them again. Um, so that we know that an LAPD detective actually knew what he was talking about um, with the internet or that a, uh, that a user had asked us a bunch of questions. And, and that doesn't mean that we're tr sort of trying to keep a little black book of all the volunteers we've ever talked to so that we can uh, have bad stuff on them. We try to keep as little as humanly possible um, but also to have it all in one safe, secure location. So it's not everybody's little notes on all their laptops that are really difficult to find later on and really difficult to delete when, it, when it's not necessary. Um, but we also want to take care of tracking all of the different cases we do. We now have almost 9,000 cases in here over the past four years, um, with about 1,000 of them being one troll who discovered how to troll us. Um, but, but most of them are, are separate individual cases that come in, emergency emails that come in, child protection issues, um, or BLP concerns, and we want to go in there. And, and a lot of them, we look at it, it's either not that big of a thing or it's something the community can deal with and we push off um, to somebody else. For example, this one here has, uh, has an OTRS ticket that's hiding there because we just sent it back off to OTRS. Um, but we want to know what we do so that we can track um, and we can show Jeff or Lila or Sue, Sue when she was here um, what we were doing and, and how, how important it was. Um, Sugar also actually, especially since it's open source, it's written PHP, it's what we're kind of used to with MediaWiki. Um, you can adapt it, you can adjust it. Um, so we have custom, custom settings in here to have spots for user, usernames and OTRS tickets. It automatically creates a link when you, when you go in to the OTRS ticket tries to pull up the, uh, it actually pulls up in a little iframe the OTRS ticket so you can see it. Um, and a lot of that is actually done with just a, a simple um, backend that they have that allows it to be upgrade safe, which is really, really nice. Um, if, if you don't remember, actually, we were using Sugar for almost three and a half years now, long before we knew Lila was coming. Um, <laughs> um, after going to Sugar, we ended up having, starting to try to find something that was that was a lot more bespoke, um, that was really meant to go around our individual problems and really cut down on the time that we required. Um, and so that's where we I, I started creating LCA Tools, um, which is a separate website, still still uh, located very very secret privately in the uh, um, in the office in San Francisco, but available through a password protected um, spot for all of the community advocacy and legal folks. Um, and we're creating sort of an integrated suite of tools that allows us to do as much as possible in this one site. Because every time that you end up going to, in, to different sites to try to record things, to keep track, um, you're more likely not to do it or to forget what you're doing. So if you have to take an image down, you're gonna go to, you're gonna go to common, you're gonna delete the image, you're gonna get the information, but you, then you're gonna have to go, to go to Sugar, create a case, you're gonna have to go do check user, bring it over. All of, that, all of those little steps, one, have to be remembered, and especially the cases like actually recording it, going and recording the, the release, going and recording, the, creating the case, filling all the information that you want, um, those can take a long, long time. So you want to consolidate it and automate it as much as possible. Um, so here we did a couple pieces there. Um, we integrated into MediaWiki OAuth actually within about a week or a week and a half of, uh, of OAuth being released on the, on the cluster. Um, this allows us to connect our account here, our, our LDAP account, um, and, and the foundation um, cluster OAuth allowing us to send edits directly from here without having to go on to the project itself. We do the same thing with Sugar, um, which allows us to create cases so that we don't actually have to go and create the case and allows us to record exactly what we want to record so that nobody forgets little pieces that we might be harder to pick up later on. Um, as part of that, we also created a central log. Um, the log allowed us to look back and see every little thing we've done. Um, we ha we, we ha it's individually ad adjusted depending on what kind of, of action we're doing. Um, and then we can go in and see 
sort of the details that we want to record. For example, for this DMCA takedown, we talk about all of the links that were, that were removed. We have a link up on top to Chilling Effects, which is a nonprofit uh, legal group that takes um, notices for the DMCA from Google, from us, from Facebook, from Twitter, um, both publicizes them online, but also evaluates them, has, has the legal researchers who can able to go there and look at what's actually happening. Um, how are these are DMCAs increasing? Are they all coming from one location? How is that working? Um, it also records a lot of our metadata. So if you look on the bottom, you see what country it came from, what state it came from, what province it came from, how we got it by email, by fax, by letter, um, which allows us to have the metadata on hand to make things like future transparency reports that we came out earlier right at our, right at our, at our fingertips. Um, we, th we then split up to sort of some smaller tools and some bigger tools. The, uh, the smaller tools, labeled here as the uh, sort of duplicative LCA tools, um, were created for one particular reason. Um, but we kept them around because while they'd saved us a lot of time for the one particular reason, they might be useful later. And so far, all of them have. So for example, we have a global search tool, which is exactly what it sounds like going through every single wiki in, in order and automatically searching for a tool. Um, it was created because we had a group that was abusing volunteers and vandalizing on lots of languages and lots of, uh, um, on lots of projects. And we needed to find them because they were becoming a problem. We wanted to see, see what the issue was. And we would have to end up actually then searching through every single site. It could have taken hours, if not days, to actually find all that. Um, in this particular example, we're searching for the horrible legal and community advocacy department. Um, which, and, and you go through and you see what sites that don't exist, then you're gonna start to see the sites that do exist. And suddenly you, you get pages with links of what pages that, that phrase was mentioned, um, and little blurbs where it's possible through the API, um, which can be really, really helpful. Um, and ever since, since we created it, we've now used it four or five times. It saved eight plus hours each time, which is really, really nice. Um, we also created this global page text tool, um, which is a very similar one, but of going through, taking a page name and going to see what is, what is on that page name on every single project. And it was actually included for, for this to see what the link, that little privacy policy link on the bottom of the page was going to for all of them. It's really, really helpful for media wiki pages where you know there's either gonna be something there or it's gonna be a default. Um, and so we're able to go sit here and say, well, of our almost 900 wikis, how many of them are following the policy? How many of them have the right thing? How many are overriding the default and sending it to somewhere else? Um, especially now that we've changed the privacy policy, we wanna make sure that everybody is getting the correct one, even if they're on a small language project that, that we don't hear from very often. To go through that, we also end up with these bigger report, reporting forms that incorporate a lot um, of third-party APIs to try to do as much automatically as possible, to try to make that more efficient leap of not going to sugar or forgetting to go to sugar after you've done an emergency case or something like that. Um, and that worked with a couple things. So the first off, we had the basic releases, which was essentially the exact same thing we had um, on the Google Doc form. But now we just have it on, on the, the, uh, the site, all one place, it goes into that central log and records all this information so that you see it's done and you can go in and find out that it happened um, and exactly what you wanted to do. Um, we then started getting much fancier. The DMCA one, the DMCA takedown tool is probably the most, um, the most far along right now. We try to work on a lot, on a very sort of iterative, agile process. And so as long as it works and, and a, a feature will, will help us now, we'll just release it and we keep adding more um, as we go along and as I get better at programming. Um, for the, the old DMCA process, we had to do a lot of work. We had to go down, we'd get an email, or we'd, get a, we'd get a PDF, a takedown from, from fax. We had to get that, we had to process it and get it formatted to go onto the to a foundation wiki where you able, where you able to put it on foundation wiki publicly. You then had to go get a template um, that, that we use as a warning to a users on another site adapt it for the new user and with all the file links, et cetera, 
put it on their talk page to warn them. You then had to need, get an, another template, adapt that template to put it on the DMCA notification board on Commons. Get another template, adapt that, put it on the uh, the Village Pump on Commons. You then had to go to Chilling Effects, fill out all the for fill out the form on Chilling Effects so that they got notified of everything that we had. Um, most of that information was stuff that had to be extracted manually from the uh, the notifications we actually got. Um, and then we had to go to Sugar and, and record it there, um, essentially the same information or whatever we wanted to record. And that generally meant that sometimes we'd skip chilling effects or do it a couple days later when we remembered. Sometimes we'd skip Sugar or do it a couple days when we, later when we remembered. Or just create a shell Sugar case that never really got closed, never really got finished. Um, but now we can go through here, fill out this one form, and everything gets done automatically. Um, it, pr it processes and formats all of our templates. It automatically sends um, the report to Chilling Effect. Effects. It automatically creates a case with a link back to the log, a link back to Chilling Effects, who, who took everything down, all of the metadata we need. Um, and then it gives us the, uh, the templates that we need to actually post on Wiki. So it formats the, the takedown that we actually want on, uh, on Wikimedia Foundation. Um, it, it gives us the direct link. We're actually using an API that, at the moment, all I know of is, is Google and Facebook that have access to this API with Chilling Effects. Um, it's, their, it's their beta form. Um, creates the sugar case, not only showing the log entry that we, that we created, but then also it has notes near the bottom um, that record all of the little things that we sent and wh where they went so that we can come back and see all of it later on. Um, and it also, we then format all the posts we need to make on Wiki, especially on Commons. Right now we can't use OAuth on Foundation Wiki yet, but we can do, we can do everything else. Um, and so it'll format the link and then we actually get a little button that you'll see in a second um, that automatically sends the posts straight over the commons so we don't actually have to go there um, it, saving just yet another step um, this was originally it took us about an hour plus to do a DMCA takedown and for a large process like the one I showed you a log for earlier where we had 15 15 20 different images that had to be taken down that could take hours of our time to do that um, especially because chilling effects wasn't completely ready for lots of files links to be sent all at once um, and so here's the, the notice that we automatically send down. Um, this, the, the second tool, and sort of the last tool that we created at the time, was for child protection. So this is, this is generally child pornography or other threats. Um, we're mandated by US law to report to what's called the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Um, they take the information we send, they take the file, they take a hash of it, they work with, uh, with law enforcement, they know whether, whether these things are existing. So just in the sense, for child pornography, frequently we have we have a sense of, of what that is. It's, it tends to be bad. Um, to be honest, the vast vast majority of what we have are teenage selfies. Um, that's and, and those need to get reported. They need to get taken down, but but they're they're not nearly as bad. Um, but here we do the exact same thing. So the, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children was created and it was state of the art when it was created 15 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, but their, their online web form is horrible. It has places to upload up to 30 images at once all at the bottom. It doesn't actually accept UTF-8. And so when you have an Arabic file name or an Arabic username or a Chinese username, it just fails. It wouldn't work at all. And what they tell you to do is try to call them and do it over the phone. But of course, none of us can pronounce the actual names that we're actually looking for. Um, which in, so in the end, it means that we end up changing the uh, changing the file names or changing the adaption and trying to explain it in the top, in the in the descriptions, which both take a long time and doesn't get them the information they're really looking for. Um, this allows us to both get all the information in there, but also to um, convert it into the XML to, that they want and to how their system is actually gonna, gonna accept it. Um, and and allow, so it allows us to cover our, our legal behind while doing as little as possible because none of us want to touch these things. Um, we wanna get rid of them as quickly as possible, but, it, but, but while doing everything we need to do. Um, the next 
at the moment, a lot of this is still is, is still manual. We still have to go do a check user. Um, we're, we're working on um, very closely. Um, actually, I have it though it's not working at the moment. Um, an integrated check user, so we actually do the check user from here, and that'll get logged so that a normal check user uh, can see it in the log. But it means we don't have to then go to that step. It also means that we know what the format's going to be, so we can pull it in and format it again for NCMEC, so that they're not having to read what will end up being a uh, just a blob of text with IPs in it in the end, um, which is significantly less useful for them. Um, and this goes through and sends all of the, because unfortunately their API requires seven different calls um, for every image, but, uh, but, but, but sends all of this, this through, which has been really, really helpful. Um, it also creates, at the moment, um, that doesn't have a sugar case being automatically created, but, uh, but it will. Um, so as we're going through the, uh, um, we'll be working on, uh, on getting those automated cases, getting the integrated check user, um, getting the integrated deletion. We want to be able to, to do, as, again, as much as we possibly can on that, that page so that we don't have to go in. OAuth gives us the ability to do that. Um, we also want to try to get more of the legal case tracking. Right now, Sugar deals some cease and desists, but, but a lot of their work, because a lot of the law side's work is very time sensitive, but it's all still on spreadsheets, it's on giant, giant spreadsheets. Um, that we're now that, that hopefully using tools like this we can get to be recorded very easily but also then be able to get data from very easily and get statistics um, also onboarding and offboarding we have a lot of employees who are leaving and coming we need to that we need to create uh, accounts for them we need to know what accounts are created for them what accounts they're using for staff work and what rights they have so that we can get rid of that um, when they leave or when they no longer need what they're having um, but then of course in the end the reality is, we want to give whatever um, whatever we need, and so we'll we'll take whatever they'll actually give. Um, whatever need comes up, we try to we try to solve it. Um, and so I think we're basically done with questions, but I'll be around afterwards. The great thing, of course, for, for working foundation is that everything is public. So if you if you think any of these tools will be useful um, for the community, if you think they'd be useful for you, it's all on GitHub. I'm happy to talk about them. They're all all in the under the MIT license um, and and open source thank you thank you very much James Alexander it's now one o'clock um, do you want to hang around if people and ask you questions or should they ask you remotely James I'll be hanging around for a little bit. James will be here for a little while if you have any questions